so thank you. Uh, so, uh, as Professor Janjung said, I will tell you about uh, our research, which we have done together and we are working on also now uh, during the last three years. And uh, we were actually working on two quite distinct uh, topics, uh, but uh, the common feature of those two topics is that they uh, both focus on the variability of accreting black holes. So that is the topic of my talk today. And uh, it is now already uh, 100 years uh, where uh, Schwarzschild uh, published his solution, which described something uh, which at the time seemed to be quite a peculiar uh, solution of the, of the equations, uh, uh, and which was a black hole. Uh, and uh, maybe people at the time uh, thought that uh, it is actually not related very much to a real world. But uh, as the uh, time uh, uh, went, and now uh, uh, the technological equi equipment uh, really uh, improved a lot, so now we are able to observe the universe uh, on almost every uh, uh, wavelength. Uh, uh, in the whole spectrum, and actually we uh, have realized that these objects actually are really there in the universe, and there is quite many of them. Uh, and uh, uh, the reason why we can observe the black holes in the universe is that uh, at least some of them are actually eating matter uh, from its surroundings, so that means that they accrete a matter. Uh, and uh, they are not like a boring thing which just sits there and uh, uh, accretes matter, but they also exhibit a very uh, interesting uh, uh, behavior. Uh, they change the, their uh, spectral and temporal states and so on. So that is the thing I will tell you about today. And uh, uh, nowadays people uh, uh, generally agree that uh, we can observe uh, the accreting black holes in several different uh, uh, objects in the sky. Uh, so these are the gamma ray bursts, microquasars and quasars and IGNs. So that means active galactic nuclei. Uh, and uh, so the first um, object, gamma ray burst, uh, 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 we think that uh, the engine of gamma ray burst uh, consists of either a very massive star which is collapsing uh, and forming a black hole and making a very powerful and energetic jet, or it can be a merger of two uh, compact objects, a black hole with neutron star or maybe even a black hole with black hole. But these sources are uh, transient, so that means that they happen only once at a given place, uh, and uh, uh, the time scale of uh, the duration uh, varies from milliseconds to kiloseconds. So these objects are actually not uh, uh, very interesting for me from the point of view of the variability of black holes, so I will not be talking about them anymore, but I'm sure that you have heard and also will hear, uh, lo hear a lot of them from Professor Janjuk, because she is working on them also. But I was more studying microquasars or quasars and AGNs. And microquasars uh, are the object in which we have a stellar mass black hole, uh, which uh, resides in a, a binary with some ordinary star. And usually, uh, this binary is located in our galaxy. And they are persistent sources, but they're uh, um, uh, radiation varies, uh, so, so they show outbursts, flares, or quasi-periodic oscillations. And the time scale of this uh, variability uh, goes from uh, milliseconds or maybe even microseconds up to month, uh, months and years. And quasars are actually uh, in their um, physical meaning very similar to microquasars because they are just you know a bigger quasars but uh, we think that they uh, have a supermassive black hole uh, which is uh, accreting a lot of matter and they are usually uh, with very high redshift so they are very far away from us and they are also persistent sources but they also can exhibit uh, some flares or some evolution even a very long time evolution with uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of years. 
so, uh, so even though the two uh, objects are similar, there are also these differences. So the main difference is the mass of the central black hole, and together the size and the time scales which we expect uh, uh, from these sources is different. So here is an example for a typical microquasar. The, the, the mass of the black hole is about 10 solar masses. Then the length scale uh, 1m equals to 15 kilometers, and the time scale is uh, 50 microseconds. In case of uh, the black hole which is uh, located in the center of our own galaxy, Sagittarius A star, the mass is uh, more than 4 million solar masses, so the length scale is more than 6 million kilometers, time scale about 20 seconds. And in some of the IG AGNs or um, uh, quasars we can see supermassive black hole which have billions of solar masses, so then the time and uh, length scale is even uh, bigger. Okay, so now I will show you a few examples of the interesting things, interesting variability which these sources can exhibit. So the first example is the outburst of the microquasar XTEJ1550, uh, which uh, was lasting from the fall of 1998 uh, until the spring of 1999. So on this plot you can see uh, the light curve, which uh, we were observing by two satellites. So so on the top plot we have a uh, light curve from BATSE satellites which is me uh, measuring uh, the radiation coming on from the, from the source in the energy range 20 to 100 kilo electron volts. And uh, here uh, we have a light curve from RXTE uh, satellite uh, which measures the light curve uh, from 2 to 10 kilo electron volts, so in softer uh, X-rays. And you can see that at the beginning of the outburst then is quite a rapid rise of the luminosity. Then there is uh, one very peculiar <coughs> observation which uh, when, when the luminosity rises very much up and then it fades uh, away quite slowly and then there is a second part of the outburst uh, when the luminosity comes up to even higher values than it was before and the, the time scale is about half a year here of, of this outburst. And it uh, turns out that these kind of outbursts are not uh, some, you know, unusual things which these microquasars are doing because uh, uh, more of them is doing quite similar things. So the another example is the microquasar GX339-4. And again, we have here the uh, light curve of this microquasar in the time scales of about one year. And you can see that the luminosity was uh, changing during that time. And also, here is a plot of a uh, hardness of the source. So the hardness uh, is uh, actually defined as a ratio of count rate uh, in some uh, hard uh, energy band uh, to count rate in some softer energy band. So in this case, the hardness was computed as a ratio of count rate uh, from 6 to 10 kilo electron volt divided by a uh, count rate from uh, uh, measured from 3 to 6 kilo electron volts. So that means that... Mm, Yes. Uh, yes. It is. Uh, is, it, is it possible to understand how far from the Earth or where? Uh, the, the number are uh, uh, made from the position of the source. So these are some kind it's of, some uh, kind of coordinates. coordinates. Which I don't understand yes, anything. but the uh, the the. Uh, uh, distance uh, is quite a mm, tough topic, so it's actually yes, hard to. It's impossible to imagine where in the, our galaxy is this object. Uh, so I think it's somewhere towards the center. Yeah, I know it's far, <laughs> hopefully. Yeah, so so the, the distances is from like 5 to 15 kiloparsecs of all these sources, or maybe. It's in our Microquasars are usually in our galaxy, but uh, uh, measuring the distance is another are quite complicated topic. I mean, we are in the galaxy, we are in the remote part, so, so in this sense, I mean, are they closer to the center of the galaxy? 
actually, or they are also on the, on, say, the, on the other side. They can be within those five arms, like on the other side. Yeah, but this particular, particular one, one, is, particular one, is, one. It, is it in our remote part, or is it the sure. others? So actually, uh, mm, the measuring. I'm sorry for I know, I know. Uh, measuring, measuring the measuring of the distance of the microquasar is quite complicated issue. So, so there are actually papers which say that the source is like uh, three or four kiloparsecs. So that means it's between us and the center of the galaxy. And then is also other paper which says that actually no, it's located. Uh, on the other side of the galaxy, and it's more than 15 kiloparsecs. And it, it is quite hard to tell. So it's and safe to say that it is some. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it is somewhere in the reach. Uh, the problem with measuring the distance is also that uh, then you don't know actually the, uh, the luminosity, because if it will be, uh, would be on the other side of galaxy, the luminosity has to be higher, so up to the Eddington limit. However, if it is on our side of galaxy and it is four times closer, then the luminosity is only, I don't know, 20% 20 of uh, Eddington luminosity. So that's, but uh, that's another issue. Okay, but I wanted to tell that uh, when uh, when uh, the uh, the source is in the so-called hard state, it means that relatively there is more photon coming in higher energy band than in lower energy band, and in soft state we have more soft photons. And uh, you can see that uh, uh, both the luminosity and the hardness is evolving during the outburst, and it is usual to pick uh, to plot this kind of behavior on a so-called hardness intensity plot. And then you can see that the source is actually doing such kind of a loop. So it starts uh, with a hard state, a very faint hard state. Then uh, uh, the luminosity rises while the source is still in the hard state. Then at, at the top of the luminosity, the source moves to the soft state. Then it's doing something here uh, and go down with luminosity. And then it returns uh, back to the hard states, but uh, uh, on the on the second path with lower luminosity. And this is not. This notion of hardness, so is it generally accepted, or it's applied to particular source? So the the notion of hardness is generally a ratio of counterweights in two bands, but different authors choose different bands to you know. And uh, the line is what energy What distinguishes hard and hard? Okay, so so the problem is if that it's an energy, it must be some energy. Uh, yeah. Uh, the value of whatever. Uh, yes, you said yes. This is between three and six kilo electron uh -huh, and six Okay. And ten. I'm sorry. Uh, this is uh, the the number is uh, it is not like a uh, number of energy, so but the ratio between these two. <laughs> so you can measure the radiation and compute the hardness. Yeah, the, yeah, the, the question is <laughs> it's ratio. It's not the exact value. Not any, any known lines in the spectroscopy of the gamma rays generated in, in the Earth so so. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, this is just um, you know, it is just a ratio of the of the luminosity in these two bands. So it it says you actually how fast the spectrum is dropping uh, down. Those bands are chosen. And those uh, bands, uh, uh, so there is yeah, the, the the bands so are you. No, the problem. No, 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 no. These. These are bands. These are not lines. You yeah, you look at the count. They are white or not depends on the channel, on the, on the scale. I mean the oh, for sure, but if you are looking the at the <laughs> if you are looking at the evolution. So there are, there, are di there are different problems because of course you can observe the sources. You can you can you can look at the sources with different satellites and different satellites have different energy bands and different energy sensitivity. So the comparison can be uh, quite hard and also different authors for different source uh, you know uh, can uh, define the hardness in different bands because 
they can radiate in different bands, for example. But uh, if you if you look on the evolution of this ratio, then it can tell you something about uh, how the spectral state of the source is changing with time. Okay, and I wanted to say that. Uh, uh, it turns out that also different microquasars uh, are doing the same loop, very similar. So there is something quite general in, in this behavior. And uh, also during making this loop there are some other interesting things happening. So for example, there can be a jet launch from, uh, launched from the, uh, from the source or intermittent jets, which means that there are blobs which are like ejecting from the source with very high speed. Or there can be classic periodic oscillations of the source, which are at different points on this, uh, this diagram. Okay. So I will now show you another outburst, which is also the same source, but now in 2010. And you can see that, again, uh, the luminosity path is quite similar. The hardness path is also similar. But which was interesting is that at the beginning of this outburst, during 30 days, we could see quasi-periodic oscillations from this source. And these oscillations were changing their frequency from about 100 millihertz up to about 6 hertz. And then after about a year, later when the outburst was going to end uh, we again uh, uh, were seeing the quasi periodic oscillation but now the frequency was going down with time uh, from about 6 hertz to 1.1 hertz within like 10 days so that is also a very interesting timing free feature of the source Okay, now we will look into uh, variability on smaller time scales. So this is just an example of different uh, temporal states of the another very no well-known microquasar GRS-1915. And you can see that uh, these observations are separated roughly by a day. And, and the time scale on, on this observation is several hours, or uh, let's say one hour, yeah. And you can see that the source were actually doing very different stuff every every day and was changing very rapidly its its behavior during this time and the uh, the, the states are very distinct so that is also interesting and the last example for the microquasars is the heartbeat state of IGR uh, 1791 uh, uh, which we are working on also Mikolai Professor Janjong was working on and uh, this heartbeat state is similar to the one uh, of uh, GRS 1915 even though these two sources are actually not as much similar so it, it is interesting that they show similar behavior and you can see that on the time scale about 400 seconds there are very very clear, uh, regular outburst of the source. Mm. And the last example uh, is for the Sagittarius A star. So this is the supermassive black hole in our galaxy. And in 2012, Novak et al. Uh, published uh, that they observed this very, very bright flare. And uh, the duration of this flare in X-rays uh, also was about 5,000 seconds. Uh, so not only the small microquasars, but also our center of our galaxy is doing this. Okay, and so now first question was what we can actually learn from uh, the observation of the sources like this from the X-ray light curves. And we were trying uh, to find out if we can use the recurrence analysis of, of this light curves to uh, uh, find out something about the dynamical system which is producing uh, the light curves. And we were using recurrence analysis for, for this purpose. And I was talking about this uh, here already at Rada Naukova in spring, so some of you maybe uh, are familiar. But I want to repeat the basics uh, so everyone will know. So the recurrence analysis is a, a method uh, for uh, analyzing the time series. So we have some uh, data. In our case, it is this X-ray light curve. So we have measured the flux depending on time and then we can reconstruct uh, the uh, m-dimensional phase space trajectory by a time delay technique that, that means that we uh, as uh, coordinates of the vector in the phase space we uh, take the uh, same time series but uh, shift it in time by some embedding delay 
And when we have the phase space trajectory, we can define the recurrence matrix uh, by this relation, where this theta is the Heaviside function. So that means that the matrix element R i j equals to one in the case that the trajectory at time uh, t i uh, is closer than epsilon to another uh, point, uh, which uh, is the trajectory at the time t j. Uh, so that means that after some time, uh, the trajectory returns uh, back to itself. And we can visualize the recurrence matrix very easily uh, in something which is called recurrent plot, so that we only just make a dot on the po uh, position given by the coordinates of Ti and Tj. And uh, in this way, we can visualize the dynamical properties of the system. So for example, here are examples of different dynamical system. Uh, this is for a regular motion. This is for a chaotic. What's the difference between this and Rasper compaction method of looking at the correlation of the sum of the two points? Yeah, so, so the, the basic is sim uh, the basis is similar, but uh, here you obtain the matrix, which then you can quantify. Yeah, the matrix tells you about also about the dimensionality of the source. Yes. It's much more than this, just this matrix. So, uh, but you can take the matrix and then you can define a lot of things but being it's based. It's not the correlation. Okay. Well, because it's on average of gravity. What? That's the, <laughs> the correlation means that the average over something. Over a time period, you have a certain time series. Yeah, you can. Assuming you believe in a. In okay, I will tell you. <laughs> you leverage over time, which is average over dimensionality, uh, uh, over the space, right? And, well, okay, I'm sorry. Okay, so I will tell you what we are doing with this, and you, you okay, you can you can see, uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, this is the example for a regular motion. This is example for some random chosen data series, and this are two examples for chaotic but deterministic motion. And you can see that what is important for either the regular or the chaotic motion, which are actually deterministic, is the appearance of uh, long diagonal lines. So these lines are connected with the uh, deterministic processes in the source. Uh, and the reason is, so uh, if you imagine that you have a diagonal, diagonal line in the, uh, in the recurrence plot, that it means that at some two times, uh, uh, Ti and Tj, the points are closer together than the epsilon neighborhood. And then each successive pairs of two points are close together. Uh, uh, within the epsilon neighborhood, here, here, and here. And then after some times, the two segments of the trajectory will diverge and go out from, from, from the neighborhood. And that is where the diagonal uh, line ends. So the length of the diagonal line is given by, by the number of points, which are uh, closer together than epsilon neighborhood. And uh, I have shown you already in spring that um, these properties of the diagonal lines actually can be connected uh, with the correlation entropy and uh, so with the Lyapunov exponents of the system. So I will not repeat the derivation, but the, uh, the thing is that if, if you plot the uh, logarithm of the number of diagonal lines, which are longer than some given L versus this L, uh, you should get a straight line with the slope, which is given by this correlation entropy, K2. And this correlation entropy is actually uh, the uh, lower estimate for the sum of positive Lyapunov exponents. And uh, so the idea uh, is, uh, the mathematics is uh, quite complicated, but the idea is quite simple. So if the two trajectories will diverge uh, fast, so that means that the system is chaotic, then the two parts will uh, move away very quickly. So we will have a lot of short lines, but not almost any long lines. So the number of the diagonal lines will drop quickly. Uh, uh, okay. And so this is connected with the notion of sensitive dependence of initial condition, which is one of the attributes of nonlinear and chaotic systems. OK, so uh, here is example uh, of uh, 
an actual recurrence plot which we have made. So this is one observation of the source XTEJ1550. Oh, there should be also one. Uh, and uh, this is the corresponding uh, recurrence plot here in, in red line uh, lines. And we also can look on the very uh, uh, like easy qualification of the recurrence plot, which is the length of the longest diagonal line, which is uh, in the in the metric. So this is here by the by the uh, red uh, line. And now what we are actually doing is that, that we combine this recurrence analysis with um, uh, surrogate data method. So we uh, want to find out something about uh, the light curve uh, so, uh, in, in the way that we uh, produce artificial data series which, uh, which uh, share some uh, properties of our observed time series uh, and uh, they are uh, constructed according to some uh, null hypothesis uh, and they are uh, constructed uh, uh, from a random process. And uh, we want to look at uh, the set of the surrogate data and our observed data and say if they are different or not. So if we can reject the null hypothesis or not. So for that we need something which is called the discriminating statistics. So there is some number which we can compute for the observed time series and also for the surrogates. In this case it is the logarithms of this uh, correlation entropy. And we work with the two null hypotheses. So uh, the first is that the time series is just temporary independent identically distributed Gaussian noise so there is no dynamics and in this case the surrogates share the mean and variance of the original time series and we can get it just by shuffling the order of the points from the time series and the second null hypothesis is that uh, the time series is a product of linear autocorrelated Gaussian noise so it is a linear process when uh, the uh, uh, point on the trajectory depends on the preceding points in a linear uh, way and there is also some uh, part of a white noise uh, uh, going into the process. And in this case, all structure in the time series are given by the Fourier power spectrum. So the surrogate surrogates are such that they share the power spectrum with the original time series. And they can be generated by iterative amplitude adjusted Fourier transform al algorithm. And uh, I will return to this plot. So uh, here was the recurrence plot for the original time series. This is one example for one of the surrogates. And this is uh, the maximal length of the, uh, of the uh, uh, diagonal line for the surrogates. So you can see that there is difference between our observed data and, and, and the surrogates. So it means that the parameters you fitted for surrogate data were not fitted. You have not found it. Uh, them in the best way, or the model was not good enough. Yeah, so uh, so the parameters, so the, the uh, recurrence plot were made with the same parameters as for the for the same uh, for the original time series, and also uh, as I will show you now, uh, 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 we we make it such a way that we took our light curve, uh, rescale it to zero mean and unit variance, made the surrogates, and then we, cho then we choose the threshold, the recurrence threshold, so that means the uh, size of the neighborhood, such that the recurrence rate goes from 1 to 25%. That means uh, the number of points, uh, the ratio of number of points which are treated as uh, recurrence points to all points of the metric. And we uh, find the uh, you know several values of epsilon and we compute it for each epsilon and then we average it for each epsilon. Also uh, here are other parameters which is the embedding dimension and, and the embedding delay which uh, you know is uh, in the process and we uh, have found uh, the Mm, the embedding uh, dimension and embedding delay by techniques of false um, uh, false uh, neighbors, first false neighbors, and uh, uh, and the minimum of the autocorrelation function of the of the original time series. But there is actually a paper which says that some of the dynamical properties should not depend on those parameters. 
so uh, of course, uh, so we were trying to compute it for different embedding dimensions, different uh, time delays. You can average it, and we have found out that it does not very strongly depend on, on it. Actually, it, it depends because uh, if you have a data series with limited length and you will increase the embedding dimension, then you will like lose lose the points in the in the time series, and, and at some point you just will not have enough data. So you cannot uh, compute in arbitrary dimension, right? Uh, and the same so is... What was the size of this embedding dimension? Uh, so it's about 10, yes. Uh, so so you the lower limit, this lower number. Yeah. You actually, we were, because uh, we, we uh, did uh, trials for computing for different uh, uh, dimensions, it actually does not vary very much with, uh, with dimension, because it should be independent on the dimension, apart from the numer numerical pro problems. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, and so uh, here is only the example how we compute this this NLD indicator. So this is the value which is obtained for the original data series. The crosses are values for the surrogate data. This is the average value for the surrogate data, and this is the standard deviation of this set. And uh, so Q is the logarithm of the entropy. Uh, yes, logarithm of K2. Uh, and then uh, we. Uh, take as the significant uh, as the, as the significance the difference between the observed value and the average uh, measured in units of the standard deviation of this set and we repeat it for different epsilon and an average and we obtain the LN, uh, NLD uh, indicator at the end okay Okay, so uh, now what uh, we have done with uh, our method. So uh, uh, here is again the, this outburst of this XTE, J1550, and we choose uh, observation which covers the part where the source has a uh, high flux, because you cannot use it in the, in the uh, low luminosity state because you don't have enough data and it's, it's useless. Uh, so uh, we were uh, studying these two epoch of the outburst and we computed this NLD uh, uh, indicator and it is here and you can see that uh, it is actually quite high at the beginning of the outburst with the uh, exception on the date where uh, was this peak uh, of the outburst. So on this date where the peak appears, the, the time um, behavior of the source was quite different from all the other days. So this is this point. But otherwise, the, the NLD uh, indicator is going slowly down, uh, down during the first epoch of the outburst. But what is interesting is the second epoch, when the luminosity values is almost at the same um, level or even higher than in the first epoch, but we cannot find any uh, uh, clear signs of this uh, nonlinear behavior. So we can see that the source was actually doing something else during this two epoch of the outburst. And we were also trying to look at the spectral dependence of our indicator. So we uh, uh, chose uh, four different energy bands or energy channels. So this is uh, less than three electron volts, uh, volts from three to five point one, for five four point one to eight, and from eight to thirteen. And we computed the same for for three chosen observation uh, from the first epoch. So the red one is the first observation, the green one green one is somewhere in the middle of the first epoch, and the blue one is at the end of the first epoch of the outburst. The problem with this is, uh, of course, that if you uh, will uh, you know make your energy band smaller than you have a smaller count rate so small small number of points so uh, it's more noisy than the data but anyway we have found out that um, at the beginning of the outburst, uh, the, the, the nonlinear behavior was prominent um, m the most in the highest energy band. 
But as the outburst went on, then in the highest energy band, the, uh, uh, the, uh, our NLD indicator dropped down quite quickly, but it does not drop down so fast in, in, in the second and third uh, energy channel. So this looks like the core of the nonlinear behavior. So the cause of, of this uh, um, radiation was shifting uh, from highest energies to lower energies. Okay, so now we can discuss uh, our result uh, within a scenario, uh, outburst scenario of this source. So um, uh, this scenario was also proposed uh, by, uh, or similar scenario was proposed also by Kubota and Dan 2004 and Wu et al. 2002, who made some spectral and temporal uh, studies of the source. And uh, the idea is that we have a black hole and a companion star and the companion star is uh, highly magnetized and there is some low angular momentum gas uh, uh, trapped in a magnetic trap uh, uh, close to L1 point and uh, at one mm, time uh, suddenly the, the trap is released and this low angular momentum gas starts to accrete onto the black hole and at the same time we have also Keplerian uh, flow which means high angular momentum gas which is uh, starting to flow onto the uh, black hole through the slope overflow flow. And now what's happening? The love component has much higher radial velocity. Uh, the velocity is close to free fall, far away from the center. So it will reach down to the center uh, qu more quickly than the Keplerian flow. And the electrons can gain high energy uh, from, from this, up to 100 kilo electron volts. So they can serve uh, as a medium which is inverse scattering the radiation and that means that this uh, love component actually rises mainly in hard uh, band. Then the love component meets the centrifugal barrier which is close to the black hole and then can or maybe is not but can be form a shock and the shock can oscillate and uh, this would be in agreement in our finding that initially the, our uh, NLD was the highest in the highest energy band because this, uh, let's say corona, this low angular momentum flow can be also say as, as corona, is, is uh, shining mostly in high energy band. And then the Keplerian component, the Keplerian disk is pro uh, slowly propagating inward because the, this is going on the viscose time scale. So it's, it's, it is slower than the love uh, component. And so there is a truncated accretion disk which propagates through the corona inside. And now the disk can either invoke the oscillation because it's going down and it's pushing on the corona or it can also infer the oscillation from the corona because if there is was a shock and was oscillating so there is already some oscillations and these two components are in, dynamically and radiatively coupled and uh, so as the accretion disk uh, comes out uh, it is much colder than, uh, than the la love component so it shines in softer band so the NLD shifts to lower energies but then the Keplerian disk reaches the inner most stable circular orbit and stabilizes and that means that it will uh, only uh, have a thermal emission um, so our, uh, our NLD is dropping down and the uh, oscillation of the love component are uh, ceasing by this and it, uh, within several days this corona is almost uh, accreted. So now we stay in a, a soft state with uh, lower luminosity uh, and we have no signs of nonlinear di dynamics. And now the, the uh, quite interesting thing is that during the second epoch of the outburst, there were no signs of nonlinear di dynamics. So we can say that this uh, interplay between the corona and the <coughs> disk is not happening, even though that there is some rise also in the heart component. Uh, so there is actually some corona which creates. But we can, for example, imagine that uh, the accretion disk is already there and only more matter is coming suddenly for, for the accretion disk, so it will shine more and with some evaporation maybe uh, the corona is uh, again created and we can have some hard component but there is no uh, oscillations as uh, were in the first case so th there is a difference between these two epochs. When you talk about these different scenarios <laughs> is there any hard calculation based on magnetohydrodynamics? <laughs> I will come to that later. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay. So <laughs> I so 
Uh, yeah, so the thing is that uh, uh, if it is the low angular, uh, so, so usually it is said that the corona is the thing which is radiating in hard X-ray because you know the temperature of the accretion disk and the temperature of the accretion disk is about 1 keV. So you cannot get uh, the radiation in 20 or 50 keVs. So you need to have some me medium which will either radiate itself in hard its rate or be a medium for this inverse Compton scattering of photons. And this is usually uh, said that it is a corona and it could be the low angular momentum flow. It is not clear yet what it actually is. Yes. Yeah, because it, it, it cannot be just the disk. And here you can see that the reason is that actually the, the gas is falling down very quickly, so it will gain the energy, the needed energy from the fall. Okay. Okay, so uh, we have seen that the low angular momentum flows are very important in this type of scenario. So now I would like to say you something about our second topic, which was uh, devoted to studying low angular momentum flows and shocks in them. So the idea is not really new because already in 1981 Abramovich and Jurek dis discussed the rotational bistability of the transonic accretion and uh, the discontinuous sonic point location. Okay, so now I will be uh, drawing a plot here uh, during my talk and I would like to uh, show you at the end what we know about low angular momentum flows. So uh, I will start here with a plot where on the x-axis is a radius from the, uh, from the black hole, so the black hole is uh, here. Uh, and on the y-axis is the angular momentum of the incoming matter. And what was known already uh, in 1981 is that there is a type of quasi-spherical accretion where we have a low value of angular momentum and the sonic point is located far away from the compact object. So we can start here when there is actually the bond dissolution without any angular momentum and uh, mm, draw the position of the sonic point like like that. And then there is a disk-like accretion when uh, the gas has a high value of angular momentum and the sonic point is located very close to the so uh, compact object. So we can uh, draw the line here. So this is this is the bondy-like uh, quasi-spherical accretion and this is the disk-like uh, uh, accretion. Okay. Uh, and in uh, 1995, Chakrabarty and Titarchuk discussed already this two-component uh, accretion flow model. So they said that we have this Keplerian disk and we have the low angular momentum or sub-Keplerian disk. And this can be either like surrounding the disk or it can be more spherical. Uh, the, the geometry of it is not known yet. And we can have a shock here and a post-shock here inside. Okay. Um, so now, very briefly, uh, we can treat this analytically. So the analytically treatment of shock existence in one dimension. So we can start with the uh, equation for continuity equation and the energy conservation. We can differentiate. Uh, we will, in this case, we will use Pachinsky with a gravitational potential, and we obtain this uh, relation for the. Um, um, the derivative of the radial uh, uh, inverse speed of the gas. This is the inverse speed of the gas. And uh, 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 we have a so-called critical point at the point where these two, uh, the nominator and denominator, are equals to zero here. And it turns out that for a certain uh, range of parameters, we actually can have three critical points, not only one. Uh, so I will again go here to my plot. And the thing is that the plot actually looks like this. Yeah. So <laughs> Okay. So so this this, this is uh, angular momentum and uh, for the range of angular momentum like this, for each given angular momentum we will have three different critical points. 
but uh, it turns out that if you look at the at the Mach number versus radius, so this is the Mach number, this is the ratio of the invert uh, speed of the gas to the local sound speed of the gas, uh, and then only the two uh, of the critical points can actually be the sonic points, because this is the uh, uh, O-type of critical point, so no solution can pass through this uh, one. So we have two different possible uh, sonic points. And uh, the, uh, so we can have two different branches of solution which actually share the same parameters uh, and they have also the same accretion rate, but they differ in the entropy accretion rate. And uh, for certain set of parameters, we can have also the shock. So that means that the accretion proceeds through the outer bondy like branch and that at some points it jumps down uh, while the entropy is produced uh, and uh, uh, then it follows the second uh, inner branch. Uh, but this cannot happen everywhere. It has to be only at that point when the Rankine Egonet conditions are satisfied. And it uh, turns out that this is not satisfied for every angular momentum. So the region for, for the angular momentum where, where the shock pos is possible is actually smaller. So we have... Uh, uh, so uh, these two values, uh, okay, I, I will show you some uh, example later. So I will use the parameter. So this is the energy uh, and this is uh, the adiabatic index. And uh, here we have the angular momentum uh, between three and four, but the shock solution is possible only for higher values than 3.55. Uh, uh, 54. Okay, and I will show you how the solution can look like. So uh, this is this is one example of such solution for the angular momentum uh, 3.78 m, uh, and you can see that here is the outer branch, which is a bondy-like accretion, which goes like that, and then the flow actually can decide if will. For it, if it, it will form a shock or not. And if the shock is formed, it will jump down to the inner branch. And we can see that at the shock front, there is a significant rise in density. So the two solutions are actually quite distinct. And we did this 1D pseudo-Newtonian computation with the code ZUs, and we have found out that really this is a stable solution. So it can stay like this uh, for a very long time. But then we uh, were trying to increase the angular momentum of the incoming matter still inside the, uh, the region of the multiple uh, critical points existence. And we have found out that actually the, uh, the shock front starts to oscillate. So this is the position of the shock front and it starts to oscillate. And also as a uh, sequence of that, uh, the, uh, the uh, mass accretion rate through the inner radius is no more a constant but it also oscillates and we have found out that it oscillates with frequency which depends on the angular momentum so I can show it again on this plot that for a subset of uh, angular momentum we have the oscillation of the shock front so here is the shock solution and here is the solution with oscillations Okay, uh, and uh, what is interesting that of course we we were computing everything in the geometrizite units, so in this m units, but you can uh, recompute it for uh, to take some value of mass of the central black hole. So if we uh, take 10 solar masses, which is typical for microquasars, we uh, obtain the uh, uh, the frequency of uh, of this oscillation in the range of milli, uh, hundreds of millihertz up to a few hertz. So it is here on this plot. He, uh, here are the frequencies for different angular momentum, and it's uh, up to three hertz. And we are also trying to compute uh, the frequency directly for the mass estimation of this source GX339-4, which is 5.8 uh, solar masses. And in that case, the frequency varies between uh, 100 millihertz up to 5 hertz. 
And if you remember, this is in a very good agreement actually with the QPOs, which uh, were seeing during the outburst. So the first idea can be that actually there is something going on at the outer boundary, which causes that the angular momentum of the incoming matter is changing, and the shock creates and oscillates. And uh, the frequency of the oscillation changes with time uh, as the angular momentum is changing. The other thing is that we have found out that the position of the shock depends on angular momentum also, and it differs actually quite a lot. So for small angular momentum, it is very close to the black hole, several tens of uh, m, but it can go up uh, to several thousands of m for uh, our used parameters, the same as there. So now uh, uh, the question is, what will actually really happen when we will change the angular momentum of the incoming matter? So this is depicted on this diagram. So let's imagine that we will start with a solution with a shock for some middle value of lambda. And we will, decreasing, we will be decreasing the angular momentum so that uh, we, will, so we will start someone here. And we will follow this, uh, this, this line. But actually, uh, now we come to the region where, where there is no uh, shock possible. So some abrupt change has to happen here. And, and the flow will have to very quickly go up to, to, to this point. And then we will again increase the, increase the angular momentum. But now there is no uh, reason for the flow to create the shocks. So the shock will not be created. And we will follow this this part of the of the branch so so here and again we will uh, meet the uh, value where uh, this the type of bondy accretion is not the bondy like accretion is not possible and again the, the the flow has to jump here so we will make such kind of a loop in our diagram so such a kind of a loop here and we should see how the shock is created and is disappearing so we did this uh, numerically with the code zeros and uh, so this is the computation. We were changing. This is the angular momentum. We are changing the value of angular momentum at the outer boundary, and we are looking what the shock is doing. And really, you can see that there are two uh, events. Now uh, the uh, shock is created, and now the shock uh, disappears very quickly. And when we are changing the angular momentum uh, periodically, uh, this will uh, uh, be happening periodically. And uh, we can also look at the mass accretion rate during our computation. And this is the graph of the mass accretion rate. And we have found out that there are two uh, uh, peaks of accretion rate. One is broader. This is like uh, half a million of m, the duration of this peak. And the other one is very, very short. So this is only like 200 of m. Uh, and. Um, Mm. And uh, this is important because usually the imagination is that uh, the outgoing luminosity is somehow correlated with the accretion rate. So if you have peaks in accretion rate, you can expect you will have some peaks in the luminosity also. And these two types of peaks are actually connected with the two types of events here. So uh, uh, the one which was denoted by the purple star, is a, it is the broad peak. That is the peak which is connected with this reshaping of the flow here. And of course, the duration of this peak is uh, given by our choice of how uh, quickly we will change the angular momentum. But there is also another, uh, uh, another this, uh, the sharp peak. And here, actually, uh, uh, it, it is happening here when we go uh, to the last uh, stable position of the shock. And uh, if we lower the angular momentum a little bit more, then the shock uh, is not stable anymore. It's accreted very fast onto the black hole uh, on the uh, free, uh, free uh, fall time scale. So this time scale actually does not depend on uh, how uh, quickly we are changing the angular momentum, but it depends only when is the pos where is the position of the last stable shock position, and then it accretes very quickly. Uh, okay, and this is interesting because we have found out for different set of parameters that the duration is between uh, 50 and 250 m, and if you will. Uh, OK, so the, uh, here you can see that at one point we have shock and we have some matter here. So this is a density bump. And in 
uh, the second time instance of, of, of uh, because you know I am um, saving the dumps only with some time steps. So in the next time time step, all the matter which was here is accreting at once. So this is the sharp peak. An interesting thing is that actually it agrees very well with the time scale of this flare of Sagittarius A star, uh, which was five kiloseconds, which is about 230 m. So we can imagine that there was some shock in the low angular momentum flow, and then uh, the shock meets the last stable position and was just accreted very quickly. Okay, and now uh, the, uh, all this was one dimensional pseudo Newtonian simulation with Zeus, but we also wanted to make uh, better simulations. So the first thing is general relativistic simulations, and also uh, in more dimensions, also in 2D or 3D. And we wanted at the beginning to compare our results with the one, one D case. So. Uh, we, for this purpose, were trying to use two different software packages. One is the Einstein Toolkit and another is HARMP. Uh, Einstein Toolkit is a very sophisticated uh, software package, uh, uh, and but we have found out that there are some numerical troubles, so we are troubling with this quite a long time. Uh, but the, uh, the advantage of Einstein Toolkit is that there is a possibility of fully dynamical space-time, which is coupled with the evolution of the matter. So this is very important in case you will uh, compute, for example, gamma ray burst, because there there is a lot of matter which is very quickly evolving. So you need to update the metric and the space time also. But for our case, actually, this is not so important. So we are fine with the computations on fixed background, which is actually faster because you just set the metric at the beginning and do not care about it anymore. And uh, spherical coordinates are also more suitable for our geometry. And there is another advantage of HARMP, and that is that it has logarithmic grid in radius. So that means there is no need for grid refinement. And that is very important because on this refinements of grids, there is usually a lot of numerical problems with magnetic fields and with everything. So we actually quite recently switched from Einstein Toolkit to HARMP, and now we are working with our simulation with HARMP. OK, and I will show you some results. So the first, very first example is that you will uh, take the Bondi solution. So Bondi solution is the one with, with zero angular momentum, which can be computed analytically. Uh, so you set the Bondi initial conditions for uh, density, pressure, velocity, and so on. And then you add uh, a rotation uh, to some, uh, according to some prescription. In our case, we have a constant value of angular momentum at the equator, and we are scaling the angular momentum up to the axis so that we don't have any infinite uh, rotation at the axis. And uh, so this is the plot of density, this is the plot of angular momentum, and this is the plot of the radial Mach number, which I was talking about. And uh, so the blue parts are subsonic, and the red parts are supersonic. And you can see here that uh, it crosses the sonic point somewhere here. And the computational grid was, of course, much uh, uh, bigger than this, but I'm showing only a zoom of it. And uh, if I just... Um, uh, you know, choose some value which is somewhere uh, in the middle uh, here. So the sh shock solution should be possible, and I will run the computation. After some time, I will get a stationary solution which looks like this. There is something like a torus uh, created near the black hole, and uh, we can see that the shock is not created. Uh, the, the Mach number goes down and almost touches one, but never crosses it, actually. So we can see that the Bondi initial condition leads to only the Bondi-like accretion, and we, and we will not obtain shock from such solution. So now what we can do if we want to have shocks in our simulation. So we can choose higher value of angular momentum, which is above above this region. So we know that this kind of solution actually does not exist here. But we can prescribe it as initial condition, and we can look what the gas will be doing. So <sighs> yeah, so this is the simulation. So you can see that the Mach number is going down and crosses uh, the, the line. So we have now the sonic point here, and the shock 
front, which is here. And we can see the shock front, a shock bubble is created at it's expanding and it's expanding, expanding. Uh, so uh, we obtain the shock, but the shock is not stable and it, uh, and it goes out. So now the question is, is there actually some solution which will be stationary so that the shock will be there and will be stationary because this is quite important because you need to have the more or less stationary shock which will oscillate because the time scale of the outburst which was like 30 days for example where the QPOs were were rising during 30 days it's much more of M than <laughs> than this simulation like it's hundreds of millions or billions of M's so you need to have a shock which is more or less stable and then it can oscillate and produce the quasi-periodic oscillation. Okay, so for that uh, reason, we tried another thing. We took our 1D uh, shock solution, so this is the shock solution, uh, and we copied it uh, spherically, symmetrically uh, into the 2D grid, so also the density is spherically symmetric, only the angular momentum again is prescribed like this. And we uh, run the simulation. So uh, you can see it here. And you can see that again, there is a shock bubble. The matter which was here, like extra matter, was, was accreting. Uh, but now the shock bubble actually s uh, stabilizes at some point. And we obtained really a stable shock solution. So in 2D, we have a stable so shock solution with a stationary uh, density. Uh, distribution and angular momentum distribution. So that is perfect thing. Uh, and we uh, ran several of those uh, of those computation, and we were following the position of the shock in the equatorial plane because, of course, the uh, the radius depends on theta. But we were following the position of the shock in the equatorial plane. Uh, so you can see it on this plot. Uh, this is for different values on, of angular momentum. If the angular momentum is too small, it will be accreted. The shock bubble will be accreted very fast onto the center, and we end up again with the bondi like accretion. But with higher values of angular momentum, we can see that the shock stabilizes at uh, some radius. And the radius depends on value of lambda. And if the lambda is too high, then the shock bubble uh, um, grows and grows and up to the point where it meets the outer uh, bon uh, bondy like uh, sonic point because you have to have if you remember the inner sonic point and the outer sonic point so for these parameters the sonic uh, the outer sonic point is about 300 amps uh, or 200 85 or something so it's something like here and the shock grows uh, until it meets uh, the second sonic, uh, sonic point and the shock bubble disappears and we have subsonic accretion almost everywhere okay uh, and uh, last thing i want to show you is actually a simulation which uh, is really a working progress because it's a simulation which is running just now <laughs> yeah, because this simulation runs for like uh, several days for example if you need to have long uh, time evolution so i will show you what was computed yesterday in the evening and uh, this is for somehow lower value of energy. So the outer sonic point is located uh, farther away, about a thousand of M is the outer sonic point. And, um, uh, and we took quite large value of uh, lambda. So it is somewhere here, probably in the oscillatory region, uh, but it's not, up, uh, it's not too high. And I will run the simulations, uh, and uh, you can see that at the beginning it is quite similar to the preceding case. Uh, but uh, as the time evolves, uh, also uh, the, uh, the oscillations of the shock bubble evolves. Uh, but the uh, shock bubble is not growing outside, so it's not running away. But it is just sitting, sitting there, and it's uh, doing this kind of weird wobbling. Uh, and uh, after some time, even uh, uh, you will see that the shock bubble can also diminish, and you will maybe think that it will be accreted s suddenly. But uh, uh, yeah, that is happening now. The shock bubble is smaller and smaller. 
Yeah, but uh, it's actually not a critting. It stops at some position and it's again, again growing, and the oscillations again appear. Uh, yeah. Uh, so there is something similar like in the 1D computation. And uh, I can also show you because also in this harm P you can look at the uh, mass accretion rate through the inner boundary of the grid. So for this simulation it, it is here, so I went up to 150,000 amp and you can see that there are some oscillations, spikes and peaks uh, in the accretion rate. So uh, we want to proceed with this type of simulation, we want to find out uh, about these uh, oscillations, if they are real or maybe they are some numerically uh, dependent or, or not, I don't know. And uh, then we want to also look at the dependence of the shock properties on, on the matter distribution, because you have to assume some initial distribution of the gas and it can actually uh, uh, affect the uh, evolution of the shock uh, and we also want to study other things like a dependence on the spin of the black hole because all these computations were for zero spin and influence of magnetic field because these were only hydro simulation but with harm p should be quite easy to also have magnetohydrodynamics the problem is that the simulations probably will be uh, much slower so to obtain such long uh, simulation times to see the oscillations will be probably uh, much more uh, complicated with also magnetic fields and maybe we will also look into for example including the keplerian components into the simulation so we would see the interplay between the keplerian component and the low angular momentum flow or add some more physical properties and of course compare our result with some real observations okay so that's all uh, thank you for your attention This, this these are fluid uh, hydrodynamical co codes for uh, uh, for flows. Uh, so it is the ideal gas with such equation of state. Uh, yeah, but there also exist the particle in cell codes, which uh, do also something like uh, flow simulations, but they are following like a fluid parcels moving f uh, in the grid so the then the structure of the code is different than in this case so the input is the equation of state mm -hmm. and then yeah or is it yes the, the, but the trajectory Yes, yes. And we want to add magnetic field. And with the equation of state, actually, Professor Janjuk was working with Harm and uh, on a separate uh, project, and she add a more uh, sophisticated uh, equation of state with nuclear matter equations. So then you can have really the uh, cooling with neutrinos and this kind of stuff. But of course, that is this this is not for this project. Maybe somewhere in the future. But again, that will add a lot of computations. So you will not be able to compute to such a long time. And of course, in our case, because we have ideal gas and we have the, the static background, our, our uh, simulations are scalab scalable uh, with, uh, with the mass of the black hole and the density of the gas is just uh, like arbitrary units. But if you take into account the nuclear equation of state, of course, you have to compute the temperature and the kind of ta stuff because the equation of state depends on the pressure and the density. And, uh, yeah. So it's mar much more complicated. Okay. So. Thank you.